All right, we're gonna start the first in a series of videos designed to assist KYR members in the use of the new KYR statewide contract. To begin, I'd like to give you a little background about it. Um, several members came to us and several leadership officers came to us and decided that it would be a good idea to have a statewide contract, especially since there was a lot more relation between brokers or transactions between brokers um, from different MLSs. Uh, and accordingly, in order for them to all be, quote unquote, speaking the same language, they wanted to create a contract that would cover the whole state so that a broker in one association would at least be familiar with a common contract of a broker in another association. Now, this contract may at some point become the contract for the entire state and every MLS will use it, or it may be one in which an MLS uses it secondarily, meaning that they have their main contract uh, and then they use this one when negotiating or working with brokers from another MLS so that at least they have a common basis to negotiate and don't have to go and read a brand new contract every time. Uh, we'll see how that progresses, but this is designed to help whatever process is in place, these videos, in order to uh, assist its members or assist our members in understanding what's being presented. So we're going to start out with page one, uh, and we're going to start out essentially with the top of the page and talk about the initial things you're going to notice with this contract that may or may not be familiar with your or same as your local contract. To start out, this is for KYR members only. If you look at the contract in the upper left hand corner, it very clearly says that. Um, and this is copyrighted. Um, just for your familiarity, this contract is a very similar to the contract used by the GLAR in the Louisville metropolitan area. Um, there are a few differences. Uh, but the GLAR was kind enough to uh, allow the rest of the state to uh, utilize and base this contract primarily off theirs. And, and we appreciate, uh, obviously, their input and uh, their graciousness in allowing us to do that. Uh, but let's start with this. It is a KYR members only contract and it is copyrighted. Now, what does that mean? That means that you should not hand this to somebody that is not a KYR member. Um, you should not allow a non-KYR member to use it or assist them in using it. So for example, let's imagine that you're a listing agent and a uh, buyer's agent comes to you, a selling agent comes to you and says that they want to submit an offer to you. If they submit this to you and you recognize that they are not KYR members, maybe you should say something to the effect of, hey, you know, this is a copyrighted contract and I think it's only to be used by KYR members. Um, now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't submit it to your client. I think you have an obligation to do so anyway, but I think you also have an obligation to let the selling agent who is not a uh, KYR member know that they may be in violation of a copyright. Um, now, so if as long as the selling agent is a KYR member, you should have no problem. As long as the listing agent is a KYR member, you should have no problem in this sense. If it the selling agent doesn't have, isn't a KYR member, it could be that the listing agent decides to write up the contract and then ultimately get it uh, signed by the selling agent's clients, the purchasers. Um, that's something that you could look into as well. But we should really discourage its use outside of KYR members. Um, so let's talk about the format of it. If you notice, it's designed to essentially follow the timeline of a transaction. Um, that was part of the process and its creation. And if you review it as a whole, you'll see that's kind of how it works. It starts from the beginning and moves all the way up to the end to closing and to the very end a mediation and arbitration uh, provision, uh, just in case there are some misunderstandings that need to be handled in the uh, legal arena. One of the things you'll also notice is on the left-hand side of the contract, you'll see a series of numbering. Um, that numbering is designed to help you and your clients get to a particular provision much quicker than you may have been doing before. So for example, if you are trying to discuss a particular um, issue with regard to the earnest money deposit, Instead of saying paragraph four, page one, about four sentences down, 
you can strictly say line 71. And guess what? You're right there where it talks about a grant of written a grant of written extension of time, how to void the contract, pursue a claim of damages, etc. It gets you right to that point without trying to guide them through this very difficult direction process. You just say the number of the sentence you want them to go to or the line you want them to go to, and they'll be right there. Um, at first, people said it made the contract look a little busy, but I can tell you that after about a year, I've seen people using uh, the GLAR contract. It's actually been much longer than a year, but the GLAR contract that had it, uh, I have heard no complaints from anybody um, and most everybody I have talked to has said it's been a welcome addition and has been very helpful in dealing with their clients uh, and directing them to various points within the contract. Now, again, you, you should look over this whole contract, but I'm here primarily to highlight a few points. The next point that I would talk about begins on, let's use those numbers, line eight. Um, and if you get to the, la the beginning sentence, last part of line eight, it says the parties are hereby advised that the other party and or the other party's broker or agent may not treat the existence, terms, or conditions of offers as confidential unless there is a confidentiality agreement agreed to by all parties. Uh, you may not have that language in your contract, but I can tell you even if it's not in the contract, that's the law. A lot of people think that you can stamp confidential on your offer and that makes it confidential. It doesn't. Um, both parties must agree for it to be confidential, meaning the buyer and the seller must both agree. And in fact, you'd actually want the buyer, the seller, the brokers and the agents to all agree to confidentiality just to be on the safe side. And that should be in writing signed by all the parties. You should have that done before you submit any offer if you want it to be confidential. And lastly, on that point, failure to advise your client that an offer that they are submitting may be treated as non-confidential by the seller, meaning that if a buyer's agent fails to tell their, their buyer of that fact, uh, that's an ethical violation. So on top of not helping your client, you're actually violating your code of ethics. So you wanna make sure that they understand that anything that they submit is not confidential uh, unless they work out an agreement in advance of the submission. So that's really just kind of a warning because there had been some confusion on that and therefore that was placed in the contract. Now on number uh, line 11, you're gonna see some information with regard to calculating days and times. Now, this is very important because as you know, a lot of things depend upon you how you count time. Meaning, is it hours? Is it days? Is it the day of, the day after? Well, this really tries to clarify it and make all references to time work as they are described in paragraph 11. So let's look at that, or I'm sorry, line 11. Calculating days and time. All days are calendar days, midnight to midnight, calculated beginning on the first day following the acceptance day, if applicable, notification day. The time of day shall be calculated using the local time of where the property is located. All right, so let's break this down and unpack this. First, let's imagine that it is the second day of June and you have signed this agreement and it says that the person has two days to respond. Well, that time will not begin on June 2nd at 5.05. That time will begin on June 2nd uh, or June 3rd because that will be the day following acceptance day. So just keep this in mind that you're not, unless you identify hours, you're not looking at hours anymore you're looking at days. So again, if you say this is gonna take, I want a response in two days, that clock does not start running until 12.01 of that night. So again, if you say that on June 2nd, the clock doesn't start running until 12.01 on June, 12.01 p or a.m. on June 3rd. Remember, you're not counting the day that you sign it, you're counting the very next day as the first day. It also says the time of day shall be calculated using the local time of where the, where the property is located. So let's imagine that you are putting a time on there. You need to make sure that you're recognizing that if you're making the offer in the East Coast time, 
that, and the property is in the um, central time, that the time that's going to be followed is going to be central time and obviously vice versa. Um, and that could have a profound effect on acceptance dates or notification dates up to probably 23 hours or more. So you want to keep that in mind when you're working on us. Don't forget if you're near that time zone line change that you understand that wherever that property located is going to be the time that's going to be referenced regardless of what you write on the contract. All right, the next portion is you want to make sure that you include all of the applicable information for the brokers and agents involved. You've got the listing company, the license number, the agent name, the license number, agent telephone, office telephone, agent email, co-agent name, uh, license number, agent telephone, and primary fax. And again, you go then to the selling company and it's all the same or similar information. Um, you want to make sure that you fill this out accurately. Um, if you don't and there is a failure later on and it turns out to be the fault of the person that filled in this information, uh, there is a potential for liability there. So you want to be very careful. Uh, now our next video, we're going to begin by talking about the offer and the property and how to describe the property. And uh, hopefully that'll be of some help as well. And we look forward to helping you through all these uh, short vignettes uh, designed to assist you in use of the Kentucky Realtors residential sales contract.